Hello friends and welcome to Bible study. We are in the NIV. Uh, we are starting a new uh, book today, uh, Philippians. We're going to do verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 26. Um, some backstory here because this is not, a, this is a letter, of course, from the Apostle Paul, as would be expected. Uh, biblical scholars do not argue about this letter. They, are, they have a firm, like, this is the time period in history in which it exists in. Here's where we're at when it's being written. So there's things to remember with any one of these. Just because they're in a particular order in this book. No matter what version of the Bible you're in, the order of the books for the Protestant Bibles tend to stay in the same order, even if the wording changes, right? There is a reason that that exists. Um, and it's really about ease of our comprehension. It's not necessarily in chronological order, okay? That's a thing to remember. This letter was written in... That looked like kind of crazy for a second there. This letter was written in 61 uh, AD. Okay, so very early in the church. And um, so we're talking about before the Council of Acts that decided things like circumcision and things like that. That's why that subject keeps coming up. Uh, it's a very early text. This is before the Bible was written. Okay, because this is before the Gospels were written down. So everything that's being taught is via, via mouth. There are no written documentations. Now, Philippia is a Roman city. And its location in the world for us, uh, like what's the, you know, for our modern day locations, is this is Macedonia, which is in Greece. Uh, and it's, but it's North Greece, um, along the border of Bulgaria and Albania. Now, well, it was a Roman city, so a prosperous and wealthy city. The church was poor because it was small, but they were very loving. So um, they, you know, sent somebody. They were very worried about Paul in prison, and they sent somebody with a gift in a hopes to, you know, lift his spirits, and it worked. So this this letter is him. The person they sent got sick while they were while he was visiting them. And then that made Paul feel very bad and he was very sure that he wanted once the guy got healthy that he needed to get him back to that to his home where he belongs before he gets like sick again. Like let's get you out of here before something else happens. Take this letter and go, you know, give it to read it to the church, you know, with my I truly appreciate you because Paul's in prison in Rome at the time that, that this is, this is occurring. Okay. Uh, verse one, chapter one, Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippia. So understand that when Paul's saying saints, he's, it's a, uh, there are apparently saints in every church. Okay. Uh, together with the overseers, bishops, and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving and prayer is what this uh, parable is called. Verse 3. I thank my God, every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, so until the second coming. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you. And I can say the same about all of you. Since I have you in my heart for whether I am in chains or, or defending or confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. 
God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus, man. Like, I wish I was there hanging out with you. And because I Meanie was in prison, so I'm sh very sure that was true with all his heart. Uh, verse 9. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight. May you continue to ascend and heal my friends so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Yet discernment. If you're going to pray for anything, pray for discernment. Because if you ask him for discernment, it'll let you see who's full of crap, who you should listen to, who you should trust, who you shouldn't, what's from him, what's not from him. Because there can be a lot of noise on any plane of existence that one can interact with in this world. Like no matter where you are, there can be a lot of noise. And you know, the opposition, icky people in the world, mental, emotional, spiritual, the opposition, whatever definition you'd like to give to that, they're looking to confuse you. So discernment is your best armor, in my opinion. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul's chains advance the gospel. Verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. So some people be in, feeling like they need to be in competition with those who look like they're shining a little too bright with the Holy Spirit. So their motivation for talking about God and telling people to act right might not be from a pureness of heart. And it might be from a desire to look good to other people. Clout chasers. Uh, verse 16. The latter do so in love knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. People can get real riled about the gospel. I gotta say that, just reading the Bible. Occasionally I get people who come on and want to hurl all kinds of insults. It's kind of like, wow. That's a very strong reaction to a book that's existed your entire life and the life of almost any ancestor that, you know, you can even trace back to try to find, unless you're of very particular origins. <laughs> the former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, the clout chasers. Not sincerely, lip service. Lip service people have existed since the beginning of time. But, you know, we if you take evolution into account, which I am a person who does science, so I don't see I'm an alchemist. I, don't, I see how the religion and the science overlap on each other and the consistency across uh, cultures because that's where I start honing in on what's the truth or not because science asks for repeatability and it's there. You just have to be dedicated to the looking for it. Not out of confirmation bias way, uh, but if you don't look, you're not going to find Right? If you don't do a study, you're not going to find it. So you have to do a study. And that requires you to calm down and be objective about it. So since the beginning of, of time, there have been cloud chasers. But we, as we evolve from a species, learn by watching. So sometimes people start that way. And they don't end that way. Because all they know is that they're supposed to do this because it seems to work for other people. And then somewhere along the way, they create enough of an opening for the Holy Spirit to get in. Now, 
You can't just do it from that mindset. You have to have the intention of opening. And you can tell that by the words that they're going to use. Because the Holy Spirit can't come in unless you ask it to. So if they're just doing it in public and it's not them opening to invite the Holy Spirit in, their behavior will never change. They won't stop their crappy behavior. They'll still be disrespectful to people. Their words and actions won't be in alignment. You can tell, but it requires you to slow down and really listen and not be in a rush to make the interaction what you want it to be. That's a wounding, making, trying to make things what you want them to be instead of taking people for who they are in that moment. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely. Supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. That's got C. And some late manuscripts, the verses uh, 16 and 17 have been reversed. Saying that sometime, he said, instead some of them are, uh, people want to stir up trouble for me. So they go pretend to be preachers. Just so they can make trouble. But what does it matter? Like they think I care about their motivations. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. They can accidentally open people who will then be able to see through them and want to get away from them anyway by being around them long enough. If you are op really open to the Holy Spirit, the crappy people around you, their words and actions, they become obvious to you and you start going, ew. Look over here. Uh, and because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. God will use whatever energy is in the room. People aren't more clever than God. They just think he is. Uh, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And it's got A, or my salvation. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. In the early church, it was very much so a belief system, and there still is, I think, in the Catholic Church itself, that the more you suffer for your faith, the more guaranteed you are to get into heaven. But that's not really how it works, in my opinion. He's already forgiven you. So if you just believe he's your Messiah, then you get into church, and you don't actually have to suffer. Now, your suffering can make you an example of resiliency for other people. Verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live in Christ and to, uh, and to die is gain. So if you live believing you know believing that Christ is your Messiah and then you die you're supposed to be okay with death at any moment because you know you're gonna rejoin Christ in heaven and that is supposed to make you happy that's how Paul writes okay if I am to go on living in the body this will mean fruitful fruitful labor for me that, and that's true. As long as we're alive, we have to keep working. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. Okay. Uh, I, I, I do know. I, I'm not ready to shuffle off my mortal coil. I am torn between the two. I desire to uh, depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this. I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith. Well, I can't die yet where my friends are still need my help and I still need my friends help. I mean, everybody needs a reason to keep living. So Paul really, really does appreciate these people. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on the account of me. Think how happy you'll be when I'm out of this prison and I'm not dead and I can join you again in friendship. 
it's something to look forward to. Because everybody who's feeling in some like they're in some side of confinement, whether it's a physical imprisonment, mental imprisonment, emotional imprisonment, spiritual imprisonment, any any nature of that needs something that they can focus on that is their reason to get themselves out of the situation they're in. Everybody needs a motivation. And Paul so appreciates these people that seeing them again has become his motivation. He's all right with dying in Christ, but he's decided he would rather live so he can go see his friends again, and isn't that a blessing? I certainly think it is. I hope on this blessed Sunday, all of you have reasons to make you feel overjoyed as well.